After more than a decade of League of Legends, the game now has an extremely diverse champion roster. With so many new ideas and new champions coming into the game each year on top of plenty of old champions being revived with shiny new reworks, it now leaves us with an interesting topic. Clearly, Riot's goals these days is to design new champions with insane levels of depth and complexity, with some champions being released with 5 weapons to use. But what about League's oldest champions? Why are they falling apart? And even more specifically, why is one type of champion being completely removed? What happened to an entire design philosophy known as the stat sticks? Hardcore players already kind of know which champions need to be updated, and most of the time they already know who eventually is going to receive a full rework. It's not always about a champion's completely terrible design, because some extremely old kits have still managed to find a place in the modern day game, although it's quite rare. When it finally came time to rework Kale and Morgana, Kale did receive a big overhaul to her kit, changing her abilities a lot and essentially unlocking a new version of her design. However, for Morgana, who is just as old of a champion as Kale, she received more of a little update. No truly major changes, and that's because Morgana's kit still manages to be useful and relevant in today's game. Champions such as Kennen, Anivia, and to some extent Teemo are almost exactly the same champion that they were nearly 10 years ago. One type of champion design that was very common in League's early days is the one that this video is about, which is the stat stick design, otherwise known as stat checking champions, or simply stat balls. This type of champion design has a lot more to do with a champion's, well, stats, go figure rather than some of their abilities and their complexity. Typically, these champions have very simple abilities. They will be very easy to pick up and learn, and will be pretty straightforward to master. As with any champion in this game, you will still have to learn matchups and know which ones are favorable and which ones are bad, but overall, it shouldn't be that hard. With more simple abilities comes a more simple playstyle. But then that makes you wonder, how can that champion function in Season 10, where champions are designed to have massively impactful abilities, overloaded kits, insane passives, utility, mobility, and versatility? Well, simple. These champions need to have a lot of stats, and that's where their name comes from. Dr. Mundo may not have 5 abilities, 12 passives, 20 forms, and evolutions, and stealth. Mundo might have extremely basic abilities. But you know what else he has? Mundo has health regen on his passive, current health damage on his main damaging ability, built-in tenacity that becomes permanent tenacity late game since you can always have your W ability turned on, built-in magic resistance which goes up to 42%, a massive AD steroid that can give him up to 200 attack damage, and max health damage on that same ability, and of course, 35% movement speed on his ultimate on top of its insane healing. Mundo is probably League of Legends' ultimate stat checking champion. He runs at you, and he beats you with his stats. It doesn't really matter all that much how well you played the fight, or how well the Mundo plays the fight, because when you encounter him, he either has enough stats to kill you, or you have enough stats to survive, or maybe even enough stats to fight him and kill him. There's no real way to outplay a Mundo aside from literally dodging a cleaver, not because the champion is broken or that I'm saying he's currently OP, but rather because it's actually true. The outplay part, the counterplay part to Mundo, is not in how his abilities are used, but rather how the champion itself is being used. The skill of Statball Champions is purely based off of knowledge of the game. It doesn't matter if Mundo is extremely strong and built all the correct items if he never groups or shows up to a teamfight. Conversely, it doesn't matter if Mundo groups at all of the right times and is always in the right spot if he builds 6 Hex Drinkers versus a full AD team. 
There's nothing inherently wrong with champions being simple, because they still serve a very important purpose. Being easy to learn allows players who pick them up to have the capacity to learn the actual game, and it's a fantastic idea for lower elo players or ones who are new to the game to stick to the simple stuff. Why is it then that we constantly see these types of champions being reworked and updated this year? Why do players say that Trindamir and Volibear are outdated? Why do people beg for Master Yi and Mundo reworks? Well, in order to understand the history of stat sticks, we have to go back a few years. When League of Legends was first released, when the MOBA genre was just taking off, almost every single champion was relatively simple in the game. They were straightforward. And that makes a lot of sense. The year was 2009. Riot not only did not have the technology, knowledge, and experience from making over 140 champions like they do now, but honestly, no time or money to do that. They weren't worried about making the coolest concept of all time for the already most successful PC game ever. They didn't even know if League of Legends would be popular or not. Back in the day, they drew champion splash arts on MS Paint. Yes, literally. To say that the champion design team has come a long way is still a massive understatement. Their design philosophy has been completely revolutionized. The term statstick is said to be on forums coined by World of Warcraft players, and they describe it as when players equip weapons just because of their stats, not because it makes any sense for your class. Examples being mages using healer items, or if a mage is whacking you melee range with his stick, he's either a complete idiot noob, or maybe he's just using it for the stats. In that exact same train of thought, through League of Legends history, we've seen not only stat-checking champions that are designed to be that way, but also plenty of items that would turn champions into stat sticks and be used in that way. Let's take a trip through the years and talk about some of the examples of not only the most infamous stat vault champs, but also some of the most infamous stat stick items. the Metagolem. It was a phrase that was used a lot during the early days of League, and it all revolved around a specific build, and a few synergies between some items. The build was Atma's Impaler, Warmog's Armor, Trinity Force, Frozen Mallet, and some Mercury Treads. This combination gave any champion some tools to succeed, with giving you tenacity, health, slows that your opponent cannot run away from, crit chance, AD, armor, magic resistance, and attack speed, all in 5 items. That's literally almost every stat in the game that you can get. The synergy between these two items, known as Atmogs, was what really shined here. Atmos used to be an item that gave you armor and crit chance, but it also had a passive that increased your attack damage based off of your maximum health. What this means is that by building tanky, you could also crit people and you gained attack damage while then once again being tanky. Your Atmas would end up giving you a ton of damage while all of your other items like Warmogs, Frozen Mallet, and Trinity Force made you super hard to kill. Even if your champion didn't greatly benefit from the Atmas or the Warmog specifically, people would still build it, sometimes even on weird champions like Orianna. Okay, maybe this one guy went a little bit too far. Because the items just worked so well with each other, you were a walking raid boss that could not only kill everybody, but do so while standing right in the middle of a fight. Champions like Jarvan and Cho'Gath used this type of build a lot, but there were plenty of other stat sticks running around Summoner's Rift. They would kill you, but you probably couldn't kill them due to their resistances and health and the fact that if they got a couple of lucky crits, you were doomed. Atma's Impaler and the Metagolem build would eventually phase out in Season 3 and Season 4 due to some repeated nerfs of the item, as well as its eventual removal to start Season 5 in late 2014. Riot did not like the idea of this tank who also did damage. But here's the thing, that wasn't even the only time that we saw Warmogs being used in some type of stat stick build. Welcome to the League of Warmogs. Many players will remember the patch that brought us the most overpowered item of all time, the Black Cleaver patch to start preseason 3. But there was another item released that day that was a very close second for being OP. This item gave you Dr. Mundo's passive for free and 1000 health, but it only cost 2650. 
For that little of a gold investment, it sparked a complete 180 in the meta. After Black Cleaver was nerfed, which was obviously a carry oriented meta, to now one of the first ever tank metas we had seen. The item would turn everybody, even the ADC, into a tank, and it was fairly reasonable to see at least 10 per game, because almost every champion built at least 2. Giving every single champion more than 2000 health just because the item was that strong, of course made fights take forever due to everybody's now massive health pool, even on the supports, the carries, the squishies, everybody. Real tanky champions would build 1, 2, maybe 3, 4, or even 5 warmogs and some boots, because why not have 5k health and ninja tabbies? You didn't have to play that well either, you had the stats, you had 5000 health, so what was the enemy going to do? Surely you can tank damage for long enough to help your team in some way. The item would eventually be nerfed and changed a bunch of times, but what mostly had to be done was increase the cost, that way it was much harder to stack multiple times. Back in the day, the League of Legends jungle was an even more crazy role than it is now. In general, junglers were a bit more supportive than today, not to say that they couldn't carry or anything, but typically junglers like Lee Sin, Gragas, Jarvan, or even some carries like Rangar or Kha'Zix back in Season 3, Season 4 typically built a little bit more supportive. In general, the jungle was just not the same 1v9 kingdom like S6. They were known for ganking and helping to ward with the support. While they still could carry, they would often build sightstone. The jungle did not give as much experience or gold as it does now as well, so usually they were thought late game to be more of a second support and mostly just a CC bot. But we had a few different times where Riot did try to break this mold, and it all had to do with farming junglers. Many of you will probably remember before Bloodraiser, the item was called Sated Devourer, where you would try to stack up your Devourer jungle item and do your best to upgrade the item to being Sated, where it would become instantly powerful. But this was not the first version of this idea. Devourer was not the first farming jungler item that we had ever seen that you would stack up the item and then turn into smurf mode. This gameplay idea was implemented in a very explosive way back on patch 4.5 with the introduction of Feral Flare. One of League of Legends' all-time most beloved and classic items was called Riggle's Lantern, and this existed all the way back in Season 1, so it was already a staple in the game. During the early days of Season 4, Riot decided to try something pretty interesting, and they allowed your Riggles to upgrade into an item they called Feral Flare. You got your flare after killing a certain number of large monsters in the jungle. At first it was 25, and then it would later be nerfed into 30. Once you completed your Feral Flare, it could still continue to stack infinitely, making farm heavy junglers nerdgasm at the possibility of being able to 1v5. Champions like Master Yi and Udyr would go to town in the jungle, with many others also abusing it. Sometimes laners would try to be slick and take smite, and try to counter jungle after they built their own wriggles just because they wanted a feral flare. It defined the jungle meta, and you would have these walking death balls of stats like Master Yi and Udyr just auto attack you to death with little to no counterplay. There wasn't much you could do to stop him because he was just stronger than you, and he could infinitely stack it to become even stronger. In Season 6, and partway through Season 7, League players had to suffer through the biggest tank meta of all time. There were essentially four things to blame for this massive rise of not only the tank power, but also people building tank items on carry champions. Iceborne Gauntlet, Sunfire Cape, Titanic Hydra, and Grasp of the Undying. If you had this combination of items and runes on anybody, even non-tanks, even non-AD champions, you would become OP. Tank Echo top lane was the best top laner in the game with this build, a champion who is supposed to be an AP assassin. Tank Fizz top lane also built this, another champion who is supposed to be an AP assassin. Plenty of other players thought it would be funny to try other things, and Valkyrie tried out Tank Talon with this build. And guess what? It worked. Everything. Literally everything worked with this build. But you know what was even better? The actual tanks. 
Poppy was a legit carry tank because she could do enough damage to stand an entire team by herself and then kill everybody and take zero damage while doing it. There's even a clip of an LCS game where Hauntzer on Nautilus tanks more than 30 consecutive tower shots by himself. 30 tower shots in a row. And of course, he lives. You know, this clip is pretty much a summary of this meta and what we had to play through. Moving on from items now, let's talk about League stat checking champions, because a lot of players remember the glory days, and talk about the end of season 2 till about the end of season 4 and early season 5 as the best days of this game's life. Over the years, I've heard time and time again that the glory days of season 3 and season 4 were amazing. But if you were a top lane player back then, I don't know if you would think the same, because the meta for a long time was an extremely stale one. While there still were picks that worked, and there were viable champions like Jace, Aurelia, Maokai, Ryze, Riven, and Shen, the top lane meta came down to four meta picks that ultimately defined the role, and all of them were simple champions with a lot of stats. Renekton, Shivana, Dr. Mundo, and Trundle, these four beefballs would run you down, dive you, and then taunt on your dead body because the mastery emote spam didn't exist yet. For the case of Renekton, it didn't really help either that at least Renekton jungle top duo would also be the bane of your existence. Before bone plating and second wind and all of the defensive tools that we have now, a lot of champions at level 3 would be dove by Elise Renekton and die 100-0 inside the CC with absolutely zero counterplay because Renekton's stun to start is a point and click. And Shivana was like a mix of all four. She did some damage, but was also pretty tanky, and scaled an okay amount. This is very different from the current Shivana that you're used to though, either as an AP or on hit champion, because she was mostly building tank. For several seasons, this group would dominate top lane, and if you tried to compete with an off meta pick, good luck, because Elise or Lee Sin is coming to dive you right now. Finally, as many other champions have gone through, it is officially time to start saying goodbye to one of League's oldest champions, which is Volibear. It's official, Volibear will be receiving a rework in the next coming months, which means that our favorite simple stat check bear is probably going to have stealth, 5 dashes, 3 knockups, and 7 win walls. Joking aside, Volibear's design has obviously held him back in some way over the years. However, champions that are similar to him can still be surprisingly fun because of how simple they are. You could be the worst jungler in the world, but if you get autofill jungle and lock in Volibear, you could probably get some ganks off and pick up some kills. He's also not terrible in the current meta because he is flexible. He can be played in other roles like support and top lane, so we will have to see if that will remain true after the rework, but for now, another one of League's stat balls is biting the dust. As more and more of them get reworked, changed, and in some cases, deleted entirely, you begin to ask yourself why. Clearly, it appears that Riot knows what they're doing here. They know that they are slowly but surely removing one type of champion. Well, do you remember the Nexus Blitz game mode? On top of being one of Riot's best overall projects they've worked on, they also added a bunch of fun new items to the game mode. One of them had the old Brutalizer icon, and it was the most expensive item we've ever seen at 7,777 gold, known as the Stat Stick. Champions like Jax and Master Yi, by the way, even with just two of these, could easily kill everybody, but the only problem is that it took too long to get more than one, because the Nexus Blitz games only went as long as 19 to 20 minutes. By playing on the joke and adding some sense of humor here, Riot proves that they are very self-aware of the situation. They know that a lot of these champions feel outdated. And I have to agree completely, I never once said that Volibear and Mundo aren't outdated and old champions by modern standards, but my question to you, is this design completely unhealthy for the game? I'll let you discuss that in the comments down below and make your own decision, but here is what I do know. In general, no, stat sticks aren't fun to fight, they don't engage in good gameplay elements. Many many League of Legends players despise Yasuo and ban him every single game. 
but at least if he kills you at level 6, he probably had to press wind wall to block your CC, he had to land a tornado, and he probably dashed through some minions and dodged at least one skill shot. By no means am I trying to argue that Yasuo is fair, not at all but at least he still has some engaging gameplay and extremely impactful abilities. There's nothing like a 5-man Yasuo ult. But if you really think about it, what does Dr. Mundo do other than literally run at you? I mean, if it's a farm lane for Mundo and has a bad matchup, I suppose he can just farm from range with cleaver spam, but is that any better? I don't know. Stat checks are like League's equivalent to the Halo game's Flood. They are by far the least enjoyable enemies to fight because you end up using the same weapons over and over again. The shotgun, rocket launcher, and the pistol in order to clear out all of their waves. In League, you just kite Volibear. You just kite Udyr. You just kite Trindamir because there's nothing else to it. If they're on top of you, they're winning. And if you've created distance from them, you're winning. And it's as simple as that. Hopefully the Volibear rework will be a massive success and can show what Riot really can do with this dead type of design and bring it some new life, but I suppose only time will tell. Anyway, if you enjoyed this video please leave a like and subscribe, and I will see you all next time.